All right, this is Patrick Rogers, and today we have the privilege to have Mark Neighbor on the show. And Mark is the CEO of Amplify Graphics and Branding. Welcome to the show, Mark. Nice to be here, Patrick. Thank you. You bet, man. So a little bit about Mark. He is a second-generation family business owner, partnered with his sister, Carrie Condrat. And Amplify Graphics and Branding has transitioned from a no-tech blueprinting copy shop to a branded environments contractor with projects all over North America. So, um, you know, Mark, look forward to digging into your story, uh, your company. Before we do that, though, what's one interesting fact about yourself that not many people know? Uh, good question. Um, not a lot of people know. I play I play golf every day. I, uh, every day. I walk nine holes of golf before work. This is this is me going to the gym. And, uh, you know, you, as I get older, I'm 45 years old, but you, you go yeah. to, you know, doctor after doctor after doctor ends up telling you, you know, if you exercise X amount per day, right, right. Yeah. All the statistics, all the statistics are so much better for a healthy life, et cetera. And uh, I tried to get into exercising Patrick and uh, I just, I just can't do, I can't go get on a treadmill for no purpose. You're like, there's no purpose in just running on a treadmill or, uh, but uh, you know, I can go and try to shoot my best round of golf every day. And uh, night, I walk a whole, I walk nine holes, 90 minutes, carry my bag. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my workout routine. Man, I know what you mean, because it's like, uh, I, I'm the same way. I can't get on a treadmill. It's like such a waste of time. <clears throat> but if I'm going to go do like maybe like MMA fighting or, or uh, kickboxing, right. And I'm learning something uh, or I'm getting out on a golf course, man, that's, that's awesome. So every day, every, yeah, every day I tried running stairs. I've tried, you know, all these different types of methods. If, if riding a bike isn't bad. I can I run our dog. Um, isn't terrible. But, uh, I, you know, it's uh, a meta, it's kind of like, a, you know, I have friends that snowmobile and I just can't understand it. They're going to take a snowmobile on a trailer, drive three hours, four hours, and then yeah. get off and just ride around. There's no, absolutely no purpose. And like the nice thing about golf, it keeps me motivated because every day I can have great shots and every day I can shoot, you know, I can have birdies. I can do, I can shoot my best round. Um, and it, 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 I get out of bed excited to do it at 530 in the morning, as opposed to, you know, go running stairs for 30 minutes. I can't, I have no desire to get out of bed to do that. You know? So what time are you on the course by? Yeah, I usually play about 6 30 right now. It's still, uh, I'm in, I'm in Wisconsin here and it's still a little bit cold in the morning. So, uh, I teed off this morning at 36 degrees at 7 a.m. That's, that's commitment, brother. That's fucking impressive. I'm telling you, man, I can't, I like getting out of, I like getting out of bed. It's something to, it's, <clears throat> I'm a competitive person. And, uh, and when I get into something, um, I just, I just go with it and keep, keep going and try to get better. And, Very cool. Uh, yeah, just, like I said, it's a it's a it's a way for me to stay motivated and in a workout regimen. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, tell us uh, tell us about uh, Amplify. Yeah. So we uh, we rebranded recently uh, earlier this year. Um, West Dallas Blueprint and Supply was founded in the '70s. My parents purchased the company in '96, and my sister and I purchased the company in 2019, right before the global pandemic, uh, which turned out to be okay for us. But we've changed the name of the company um, about four months ago um, from West Dallas Blue to Amplify Graphics Branding. And that name change came about just from, um, you know, we, we set a defined, clear vision and mission statement um, about three years ago. And it just, mm -hmm. everything about the organization, you know, we were still West Dallas Blueprint and, you know, blueprinting is down like 3% of our business today. And so... We, we, we hemmed it what does off. that mean? What is blueprinting as uh, what does that mean? Yeah, great question. So um, uh, old school blueprint, when I started in, in the 90s, um, a blueprint is what a large, large document that's used for you know creating buildings. OK, yeah. OK, so like a blueprint. OK, so all, so all we did in the 90s when I started, we had no computer network. Um, we just made copies of, with ammonia gas developed blueprints. So we would get our driver would pick up a roll of prints this big from an architect and we would make 30 copies of that and give it back to the architect and they would ship them to all the people that were working on a project. And there was there was a service that that's that's all we did um, as computers came about um, the digital age. You know, people are sending PDFs all over the place to make those things happen. So, you know, blueprinting as a service still exists, but it's not it's not a real strong business. And we, we knew that um, 10 years ago, which is why we launched our graphics and branding business in 2013. Mm. And so, um, that's been yeah. growing. so we, we sell we still sell large format printers to people to print their own prints. That's a big business for us. We've got like 1300 machines in the field. We're one of the largest Canon dealers in the United States. 
um, for large format aqueous printers. But this graphics and branding business, we started in January of 14, and um, we're doubling about every four years in that space, and we're a branded environments contractor. So um, a quick elevator pitch on that is we, we do printed wall coverings, we do custom glass, so privacy screening for, for corporate spaces and, and conference rooms. Um, ADA um, wayfinding signage at facilities. We do um, lit signage, uh, dimensional letters. Um, if you think about like a school um, under construction, we're the last yeah. contractor. We're the last contractor there. We're the ones putting the logos up on the gym walls. We're the ones putting. Okay. Um, so are you just just are you just doing this in your in your area, or are you nationwide, or or? So we are we are we have na nationwide reach. Most of our work is is within three hours of our office, but we do have projects running in about five or six states at a time. So we've got one in Colorado, um, we've got uh, we've got a couple down south. So we we've got a couple different clients that have projects going all over the place. And you know when you work on the national scale, is it um, it's about simplicity, right? The, the the customers want to be able to hire someone with expertise, know how, and and capability, and, and they want to they don't want to have to hire fourteen multiple people. contractors. Right, sure. right, right. Yeah. So if they can, so if you can demonstrate the ability to work on products anywhere, um, we, we tend to get repeat business. Yeah, got it. Okay, awesome. And so, um, <clears throat> so you guys are the ones that provide in the schools, the big logos, the you know, all that kind of stuff. Is it mainly schools you target? Do you, is that where most of your business comes from? So uh, school education market is a big, big market for us. We also do a lot of uh, professional sports. So we, we work with a lot of the um, basically stadiums, any, anything that's so higher education too. So your, your high schools, your college, well, any school, but anything education, anything athletics related. Um, you know, we're putting up um, branding and signage on the outside of football fields. Um, we're putting up branding and signage. Like I said, uh, some pro sports franchises we do quite a bit of work with. Um, you know, big, large murals on the outside of stadiums, um, permanent and temporary. So you think about a, a major league baseball franchise, you know, they they change their players rather routinely. And so we put up graphics in the stadium for all the players, and we need to change that all every time a player is traded or released or called up to take down. So um, and then there's also a uh, healthcare market. We do quite a bit in, in the healthcare market. And then the other fourth vertical would be just your corporate environment. So any old any old corporate headquarters is going to have uh, that wants a nice looking office. And, we're, you know, we're people that want to invest in experience. That's what really mm -hmm. comes down to. If you want a good customer, high level customer experience or high level employees. Mm -hmm. um, so right, people, right. You know, um, we work with uh, some Fortune 500 companies that, that all the listeners have heard of, and uh, those companies get it. They they want to invest in their spaces to attract and retain talent. Um, same thing with the pro sports franchises; they want to invest in their spaces to attract, retain fans, and and provide a you know a high level experience. Um, those are our best customers. So well, quite a few verticals will touch, but uh, that's in essence what we actually do is providing awesome. providing yeah. experience to humans. <laughs> Yeah, and you had said that that networking has proven to be an incredible resource for building your company. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, and I, I'm, you know, I feel like a little bit of a fish out of water on the podcast, Patrick, just because uh, I'm a fan of the podcast. I've listened to a ton of episodes, and oh man, thanks. Yeah, you just you have some super super high level, super smart people on the podcast, and uh, you know, um, it's funny. You know, you always ask about a book, and we're probably going to talk about that later, but. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm in awe of a lot of the people that you have on. So we're a little bit more smaller scale, you know, as far as, but uh, networking has been yeah. huge, absolutely huge for us. Uh, number one, we're part of a national buyers group uh, called the RMX network. And um, there's about uh, 200 locations, something like, uh, you know, 1,500, 2,000 employees, something like that in the network. And it's a network of uh, it's about 150 different companies that do the same type of work that we do. And our spring conference is in Salt Lake City in uh, a couple of days. Actually, uh, fly out Wednesday. Uh, yeah. we, we got two conferences a year. There's information shared going on, and uh, you know when we go to the, it's all the brightest minds in the industry um, mm -hmm. getting together to share best practices. Um, share they're they're putting together content that a small organization like us uh, for scale yeah. we're, we're you know we're 22 people right now but right. Um, it allows us to leverage uh, best practices buyers groups um, associations of a of, of much bigger scale so even like putting together um, educational materials for our customers right mm. we've got one group of people that are doing that and, and then distributing that education education stuff to, to members like us that we can 
Uh, so that, that's been huge, just to network with our peers across the country and and really get in line with the, um, you know, the peers that are doing better than us, and then also uh, a chance to give back and help the peers that are maybe a little bit behind where we might be. Um, so it's been really rewarding sure. in regards, but uh, certainly yeah. a key for success. Yeah. So if I was to look at what kind of you're sharing is, is no matter what industry you're in, like join a uh, industry organization that's dedicated towards the the success and betterment of that industry. Without a doubt. Um, yeah. And for, for big proponents of this, and they, they have a speak a lot just because there's one, there's one big investment that happened around 2013, you know, through the yeah. art group that um, a now retired but Rick Bosworth, uh, shout out to Rick, uh, put this together with some friends of his, but um, it was an educational program that they gave us um, to, to deliver to architects, and um, we ran with that content, and um, I can draw a line back to, I, I forget the number last time I put it together, but it was in the yeah. millions, millions of dollars that we did in revenue based on the foresight that that industry group put together, um, so wow. without a doubt, no matter what you're doing, um, network with your peers nationally and get, get connected to those organizations because they're there's smart people yeah. out there that want to help, you know. Absolutely. Association of Residential Property Managers, and it was so good for us, amazingly good for us. Um, we, 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 I mean, automation, what other people are doing, sales. I mean, just everything that goes along run a business. We're, we're so channel, and all we know is what we know. And then when we went there and learned all these other things that other people are doing and all the success that they're having for them, I'm like, holy cow, that's insane. So I totally, totally see that point. Um, so how, how have you guys, how do you guys get new clients with, 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 with where you're at? I mean, you have, you, you have clients up to three hours away from you and you can support nationally. Like what's your, ex like some people like, Hey, if I go get a local mom and pop shop in this, in this town, right. It's easy. I'm just doing SEO for this local area. I'm doing some direct mailers, you know, whatever for you, you have not only local, but you're going for schools that, you know, they, they don't, they don't do logos every year, right. They do that when they're building it or whatever. So what's your ex expansion and network or your market? Marketing uh, plan. How are you doing this? Yeah. So um, generally, um, the uh, we get our work from from talking to designers. So we're mm. we're not we're not bidding. Uh, so you could uh, one strategy that someone in a in a business like ours could in construction in general could just go try to find products to bid on. And um, we've had a lot more success partnering with the, the people that are actually designing the spaces. So you mentioned that there's new construction, but there's also quite a bit of renovation. So yeah. when you get to like a like a major college campus, there's there's construction happening all the time. It never it never ends. There's always a new building going up. There's always a renovation happening. So there's always an opportunity for for construction. So we're we're heavily you know leveraged in the construction space, but um, generally. You know, once uh, our, our our biggest growth is we've got the sales team that's out there um, pounding on doors and we're trying to talk to designers and architects um, all over the place and uh, make sure that they're familiar with who we are, what our products are, uh, what our expertise is. And, uh, you know, another thing that helps us, too, is uh, we're not afraid to try things that are outside of, you know, outside of you know, our experience level. So, um, you know, the funny thing, you know, again, our industries, I don't want to get too far into the weeds of the industry, but um, submittals are a thing in the industry that you have to create samples of everything that you're going to make. So it actually gives you a chance to uh, R&D live on a project if you have to, because you have to create small pieces of what you're actually going to produce in the field. So yeah. but, um, um, generally, um, you know, we're trying to talk to the architects and designers anywhere. And then what happens is, you know, um, there's a lot of architects you that have offices in, you know, the biggest architect in Milwaukee, for example, has offices. Right, offices all over. Right, Denver, Florida. Right. So um, once you start working with one and have a, they have a good experience and mm -hmm. we bring a lot of yeah. value to the table, we're one of the few people that are in the branding business that have our own install team. It's, you know, it's our guys, our full, full employees. Um, there's a lot of our competitors that don't install at all. They'll use a third party service. Or, Interesting. Or have the Interesting. That's a big competitive advantage for us. And that's what I was going to ask is, is what is your unique value proposition competitive advantage? And, and, and it sounds like that's, that's one of them. For sure. Yeah, there's a bunch. Number, number two is uh, we have, we have all state of our equipment. We are committed to state of the art. Our oldest production uh, device is two years old. So everything oh, we wow. have okay. state of the art, brand new. Yeah. And uh, there's a reason for it. We can do things that, that no one else can do unless you have this kind of equipment. Mm. Yeah, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but if you think about um, a quick anecdotal example is 
on glass. Um, if you have a high end, a high end corporate office where you've got yeah. a um, a big glass wall and you want to have some privacy screening, uh, we can print like Coke Red. If you wanted Coke Red, you can you can print on a clear material and do something custom on that wall. We can print Coke Red White and Coke Red all in one pass. So yeah. in order to have Coke Red, if you don't have the white behind it. You wouldn't have that. You wouldn't be the right color. It would be a much wash, more like a pink color, even if you tried it, you know. So, like, our equipment can do that all in one pass. Just one quick anecdotal example of how having the latest and greatest in technology. Um, there's another new machine um, that's just that's just come out with white ink, but um, also can do, like, spot gloss treatment. Uh, so, we're using one of our partners that has that device for a product now. So, a spot gloss where, think about, like, an uh, intricate floral pattern on the wall. You mm -hmm. can have just, just that intricate floral pattern be gloss where the rest of the wall is ultra matte. Um, so like things like that, where you can make things stand out um, with the latest and greatest in print technology. So um, also our commitment to sustainability, we've got all water-based products here, um, as opposed to uh, solvent, uh, solvent chemical products or um, UV curable products that create hazards. Yeah. So um, there's lots of little things that, that kind of put us above the top, but uh, our project management, state-of-the-art equipment, installation, and, uh, and experience. You know, we've, got, we've got a lot of experience with a lot of different mediums in order to pull projects off very cool thanks for thanks for sharing that and I, I wanted to come back real quick to what you had talked about that you know your expansion strategy right because most businesses again they they have um you know hey we're gonna you know our salesmen are gonna go generally if you have sales they're trying to call directly to you know your end consumer your end buyer and you're taking a little bit of a different route you're you've identified that really the people that are going to refer us to business they're really referral partners the architects the, not the end users, the people that are in charge of the construction and, and your sales focus, your outside and inside salespeople, it sounds like are going towards those referral partners. Correct. And it's kind of a, it's a golden goose type strategy, right? If we can find a customer, you know, customer acquisition is very difficult. If we can acquire a customer and do a great job for them, um, we can keep them and they can keep them. So sure. that's, that's, that's where we turn the coin on what you talked about, how they only build a school once, right? But the yeah. people that designs yeah. schools, designing schools all the time. All the time. That's what they do. Yeah. Right. So yeah, yeah. Right. that's that's exactly the strategy is to um, connect connect with connect with repeat business clients um, and try to grow our business once we once we do establish a relationship. Cool, cool. And you had um, you had mentioned before that that through the pandemic it was actually good for you, and and when everybody else uh, it was <laughs> not good. Uh, how did you make the pandemic a positive for you, man? Yeah. So. Um, you know, we had just bought the company in, uh -huh. in June of 19. Everything yeah. was going great. Yeah. Uh, Coming to March 2020, and we weren't, you know, we had no idea what to expect. Uh, my sister's a CPA by trade. Uh, I'm sales by experience. So we put our heads together. And again, we leveraged our national network. We, you know, and some some really smart people that are smarter than me. Um, they were kind of trying to do some forecasting. And they figured that business for 2020 was going to be down about 50%. So that's what we were staring at is, hey, this Wow. We have to yeah. we have to prepare for business to be down 50 percent. This is and that's what a lot of businesses experienced, myself included. Right. So we had to prepare for that. So um, our our plan initially was to figure out how, you know, how are we going to stay afloat with all of our team members at 50 percent? Right. And the first thing we did was we all we all became experts on labor law, you know, and uh, the first thing we figured out was we could target our employees for layoffs um, only. We didn't want to lay off anybody, but we could target them depending on how much they made, only, get, you know, if, uh, lay them off for two days a week, so just enough to get them under the threshold to qualify for unemployment, right? So we, they could keep 60% full pay and then get unemployment for the 40% they were getting from us. So then basically we would keep them in like 80% pay was the idea. And okay. we, we executed that strategy. Um, and then right after, right after we, you know, figured out what our plan was going to be there, we, we launched a, a product line Mm -hmm. of uh of children's activity prints so again mm -hmm. we got all these giant printers and yeah. and not doing anything with nothing yeah. to do and so yeah. we started printing um so overnight i i put together there's all this uh royalty free images we created sets of like you know um giant crossword puzzles giant mazes giant word searches giant um coloring sheets and we sold these things we kind of put out a plea online hey for 27 bucks we'll ship you eight prints and again remember kids were stuck at home out of school, parents were stuck at home with nothing for the kids to do other than wow. give them an iPad, which you don't want to do all the time. So hey, yeah. we kind of yeah. connected the dots and um, 
and said, hey, here's a $27 package. And then uh, a news channel uh, heard about us kind of pivoting and hey, local sign company is um, offering uh, offering kids something to do at home. And we we, we did like $25,000 in business after the first airing at uh, 8 Wow. Wow. Uh, and so on our website e-commerce, so all of a sudden, all those layoffs lasted like a week. We brought everybody back. And we're paying overtime because, you know, we didn't have, huh. we didn't have the systems in place. We had like a thousand orders that first day or whatever. So all of those addresses had to be taken in this system and typed into the shipping system. You know, like we don't have infrastructure for retail business like that. Right. Um, so we were paying people overtime to type addresses, you know, and then uh, we ended up going on uh, TV all over the region. We were in Chicago, Madison, Fox Valley. Um, we were on a bunch of different news networks. Dude, Dude, first of all, ton of money, and then that it yeah. was like we also did like the senior yard signs for people that were graduating in classes. Hey, here's your um, people put yard signs in front of their house for their for their seniors that were graduating because there was no graduation. So we did a lot of that. Oh, we also that. we also made face shields. Um, that was a thing that there was a market for that. So we were using graphic supplies with Velcro strap face shields for um, trying to block COVID. So we, we did a bunch of different things that raised a bunch of money and uh, and got us through that pandemic. And we ended up having it. We, we grew during 2020. Uh-huh. Man, right. that's so cool. Okay, congrats. First of all, congrats on, you know, not just like, you know, giving in to, oh, uh, you know, poor me, poor us. Uh, you guys, you guys pivoted, you pivoted into opportunities. How did you identify that uh, doing this, these, these crafts and puzzles for kids at home? How did you identify that as a team? Or, uh, you know? Yeah, so um, it kind of kind of revolves around that, that whole, um, you know, I went through a, a program called Scale Up, which we maybe touch on a little bit later, but um, yeah. a vision, vision and mission um, exercise. You know, a lot of time we didn't have, you know, we didn't have a vision and mission statement. And mm. our vision statement was that we, uh, you know, we amplify creativity through the power of visual communication. So, um, which is how we got the Amplify name, by the way, again, through that vision statement exercise. You know, the, it's the whole Simon Sinek start with why, which would probably be my book is, uh, but um you know, why do you do what you do? Um, and hey, we, we do this to help celebrate creativity. These kids are, it's just connecting the dots, Patrick. Kids are stuck at home. They got nothing to do. I got equipment that can make big prints. Um, let's help those kids be creative um, and start with coloring sheets. I had the idea at like nine o'clock at night, talk, my wife and I kind of talked through it. I had to go straight to the office at 10 o'clock. I had at the time, so such a crazy time pass. Like I had paperwork that says I was an essential contractor allowed to be on the freeway. Wow. Because we have customers that are essential, so you know, luckily, yeah. our industry, we were allowed to be you open. Were, you were, yeah, yeah. Right. I know I, that's that's what I was saying. That's why I lost so many of my. I was business coaching at the time a ton, and and so so many people became non-essential. They couldn't even operate. Right. And, you know, they had to shut down. So, um, wow, yeah. So that, that that's fantastic. And one of the things we had talked about before, when I asked, you know, what's the biggest failure that you learned from as CEO, and and you had mentioned that getting the right people in the right place in the right direction is is a constant challenge. Tell us more about how that has been a challenge for you and what you've been able to do and continue to do to address that. For sure. So I've been here since like 96 and uh, uh, I've won tons of sales awards from Canon and, and, you know, part of, part of the exercise is like, um, I mentioned, I mentioned how I'm really in awe of a lot of the people that you have on the podcast is like, I've proven over the years that I can sell, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a a salesman. Yeah. Right. And I'm relatively successful in that regard. Yeah. Um, now, um, running a team and <laughs> identifying and hiring talent and yeah. motivating talent, it's a, whole, it's a whole different skill set. It's a whole different yeah. story, which is why I'm interested in constant education. So, you know, as we, as we, as we plot our graph up, as we've been growing, yeah. you know, um, two years ago, like number one thing, we, we never, we never had a CRM. Um, and I can go back in time before right. that. We didn't, we didn't even have a quoting for, we had quotes were right. done on Microsoft right. Word. So yeah. we had to get quotes into an accounting system. We had to get a CRM going. Um, so, um, and then attracting and retaining talent. I, I found that a lot of our social media presence um, has benefited a lot in, in talent um, mm. but rather than rather than just customers. Yeah. Uh, you know, we do, we've been doing a lot more on LinkedIn um, as a company. We have a marketing coordinator for the first time. So again, um, this, this episode is more for a lot of the smaller scale guys. Like we're, we're 22 people, you know, we're going in a direction. Oh, yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> you know what though? I, I, I know you referred to that, but I, I firmly believe the, the, the CEO with a thousand people and 10,000 people can learn from somebody with 20, you know, and, and I, I, there's just so, there's no discrimination, man. I, I, it just, just every, you, for the nuggets that come out sometimes, you know, it doesn't matter how big the company is, but 
you know, there's a certain threshold, but, but man, you just, it always blows me away. I cannot think of an episode when I haven't learned something amazing from every person on there and this one included. Sure. Number one thing is, um, you know, I, the networking opportunity got us in the scale of program that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And, and that was like a hyper condensed MBA program put on by the greater Milwaukee committee here in Milwaukee. I love scaling up. Yeah. Six. It's a six month thing. And it was nice. like 20 business owners got together, one yeah. million in sales, poised for growth. And it was like a training session. On, 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 uh, uh, and the people that put it on took an aerospace company from a garage to 350 employees and sold it for a 35x multiple. Yeah, wow. My point is like, when those guys tell you what to do, I listen. You know what I mean? You're like, like, all right. <laughs> so I'm um, on it. Yeah, they got us on a real clear path on, first of all, um, strategic planning. Uh, we, we have a strategic plan that we put together every year. It's got a roadmap. You know, I need to know, like I said, you know, if I look back in time, it looks like we came a long way. Yet I look forward and we have so much to accomplish. You know, right now our project management and installation, like we're not time tracking. Yeah. At 22 mm -hmm. people, we don't have, we don't have um, accurate time. System tracking. and software for right. that. that yeah. right. So that, that's, that's something that we're going to be putting together and getting in place this year by the end of the year. And we're evaluating wow. some tools right now. We're working with our RMX network to find out what tools other people are using. Turns out there's probably not anything that anyone's using that's, going great but you know when we ask that question to our to our membership all of a sudden 25 other people are hey we, we, have we don't do that either right, yeah. right. Yeah. and so that'll allow us now again when we're evaluating tools now not only are we putting together a, a tool for us we're going to create that tool build out for us and all of our peers for us the network allows us you know some great value there yeah so i mean it's uh, i think that's a really good point too there's a lot of especially when you're small right it is you, you know you're not really thinking of things like time tracking and and you just have that person in that position and they handle that. This person over there handles that. But yet when, when you have cross-functional, cross-divisional working on a single project, if you're not tracking that time, you know, all of a sudden you had a gross profit margin of 60% on this project or 50. And if you're not tracking that, you could have one project or one client that could end up taking, you know, being un unprofitable unless you have a system like this in place. Not only that, but you can't you can't improve if you don't measure. You can't improve what you don't measure. Bam. Right. So drop the mic. Hundred percent. So, right. So and, and the other thing is all comes down to that the difference between scale and growth, which is what, what the scale mm. kind of taught me is, you know, for years um, when I worked here through the nineties, like we were we were butting our heads again. You know, try to get one more client, try to get two more clients. Um, mm. but, and, and okay, that's that's going to grow your business, you know, five percent marginally. Right. And so it's a different mindset to think about how you're going to scale your company. How are you going to grow 18% every year? And in order to do that, you need infrastructure that works. And, and it's so funny because every, every you know, I, heard, I forget who told me this, but you know, every million dollar company wants $10 million company infrastructure. Every $10 million company wants hundred million. Yeah. And yeah. you never get there until you're Amazon, you know? So it's like, but that's, that's the, you know, you know, right now we're creating segmented systems. And then, you know, at some point, like a NetSuite product might be good, like an everything system, but yeah. you know, everything systems are expensive. So it's that constant struggle of, of infrastructure yeah. laddering. But the point is, at least you see where you're looking to improve and what you need to scale and got to have it. If you're not going yeah. yeah. to measure, if you're not going to measure how much time a project is taking in project management, other than just estimate it high and hope you win. If you're not going to measure it, yeah. now you can't, you know, we're real big on smart goals for everyone on our team too. And good. If we're not, if we're not, um, you can't, you can't create a smart goal that's not measurable. It's in the name. It's measured. That's what M stands for is measurable. So um, our team finds that we challenge our team members, everybody here to create smart goals for the position and how, how the company can become more successful, more profitable. And if we're not measuring um, a lot of the basic yeah, stuff, it makes it very difficult for them to come up with a goal. It's like, Hey, I, I want to be able to, to, to come in under budget on projects, but if we don't, there's no way to measure it. We have to have a system to measure it. And then there's a lot of other things that we can we can bring into this. Like we don't have a real good, um, we have a, an installation calendar yeah. and we have a project management calendar. Um, we should have one calendar with both teams using the same right. tool, right? right? That's something right. that we can integrate with this rollout too. So again, it's like, that's something for this year. And then next year it'll be the, the next infrastructure rollout in order to keep, in order to keep building. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you're, you're investing in software automation technology. It's going to help your team collaborate, have a lot more transparency and just, just reduce a lot of the, the overlap and autonomous, uh, not autonomous, but, but emails that are maybe unnecessary. Fantastic moves, man. For sure. Cutting on email too. That's uh, the only way we communicate with our customers today is through email. Mm. So 
you know, you know build, yeah. build, building out this portal that we're talking about is going to allow a, a client front end. So now a client can yeah. see the schedule of the project, see the status of the project without yes. on it, sending emails. Yes. To that right. Well, that's something I, I think you raise a great point, And that's something I, I recognized early on too, that if you have siloed individuals emailing all your clients on a project from their email database, instead of through a centralized software, uh, that you can go and just click on the client and see all the communication to the software, all the the status, everything right there. Because otherwise, if you have to track down an issue, good freaking luck. Or if that employee leaves, good luck. You got to go through all his emails, right? Is that kind of where you're going with it? Right. Or a meeting exactly. record. Even if you recorded a meeting, a, a, a kickoff meeting for 38 minute meeting, you yeah. Record, and yeah. we found there was a date that was written down when a certain milestone was supposed to happen. Like I wrote it down by hand. Like where are all those? You know, we got to be able to store all that stuff. So again. It's, it's the thing about growth versus scale. Like we have two project managers today in our project management team. Um, we've got an open position for a third. Like this works okay with one or two people. Yeah. With, if you're going to have five or six people though, you, right. you, you, need, a, you, need, a you need a tool. You need a tool. tool. Awesome. And we yeah. see that. And so in order to get to four or five or six people, we, we got to, let's build a tool out now. Let's build it right. Get it in place. And then it allows us to, again, I overuse the word, but um, scale instead of grow. That's the no, idea. Yeah. Total, total different mindset. So uh, I know you alluded to the book before, but I'll go ahead and ask the question. If you're going to hire a CEO to take the reins for your company, what's the one book that you would require he or she read before uh, taking over and why? Yeah, as a fan of the podcast, I knew you were going to ask that question. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just not, I'm not, a, you know, I thought about like faking, faking an answer, but um, I'm not a big book reader for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah. I, I own a few books. Um, uh -huh. I have Traction, um, which is a popular book for business. Yeah. Yeah. I have uh, Another Simon. version. Simon Sinek. Why, but I've never, I've never sat down and read either of those from cover to cover. Right. Uh, I, I said I'm huge on education. I just personally am not. And you know what's funny is I, I mentioned before about how I'm in awe of uh, all the great smart people you have on the podcast, and they all read all these books. Maybe, maybe that's an opportunity for me. To, maybe that's a missing component. Huh? Maybe I should read some more books. But um, I, I get education other ways, and that's what I was talking about. Is I'm big on the network. Yeah. Um, we, we engage in the um, the local chamber of commerce here. In a cool. CEO roundtable, in a sales roundtable, uh, or part of the Greater Milwaukee Committee, we've got community outreach program. Um, my point is, uh, my education tools. What I've tried to do is just kind of suck up to smart people. I've got a number of mentors. Uh, cool. That's another takeaway that I think people might be interested in. Is um, you know, I'm having lunch. I'm having lunch. Uh, I can't remember if it's, it's this week or next. I'm having lunch with a guy that uh, they've got about 110 million dollar business. That's I end up in the same space as us, a little bit of a competitor, but uh, I sent him a message and say, hey, I'm a big fan, and uh, I think I could learn a lot from you. I'd be interested in, in, in going to lunch, and we've worked with them a little bit as a vendor of ours, and uh, we haven't recently, And uh, but anyway, yeah. um, you know, if you send a message like that, he was happy to, hey, love, love to talk to you, let's go to lunch, you know, and uh, I, got cool. a, I got a feeling I can learn a lot from from this individual, and the point, the point is that when people ask me, um, yeah, happy to. Um, I'm part of a mentor project through Big Picture Magazine, which is a trade publication for large format printing. And uh, um, it's where they actually connect you uh, as a as a CEO. They connect you with, uh, with, with someone starting in the industry somewhere across the country. Yeah. And, uh, and you get together once a month and, and mentor and, and help them to grow in their career. I'm huge on that. But uh, same idea on both sides, mentor and mentee. Um, if, you if you ask someone that that you think has got it going on, I bet you they'd be willing to they'd be willing to, to meet with you and talk. Very cool. Awesome. And that's what I was going to, I was going to ask, uh, get there in a minute, but the, the one takeaway that you'd really want the audience to absorb, it sounds like is, is that networking and find a mentor to help you in, in your business, somebody who's already been successful at what you've done. For sure. For okay. sure. Cool. And cool. going through that scale up program, I know I talk about it a lot, but yeah. you know, the, the, the second meeting we had to kind of give an update on our company and I'm sitting at a table and I'm next to a, a guy who had a, a little machining company called, uh, well, it doesn't matter what it's called, but, yeah. uh, and uh, he gave his, his company update um, for the second meeting. So we're a month in and he's like, um, so he hired, he hired 10 salespeople in the last month. And so, you know, I mentioned that we're 22 people. I, I'm sitting, it just puts you in a different mindset when you right. start working and having conversations with people that are hiring 10 people in a month. Mm -hmm. um, hey, you know, there, there's a lot of conservative people. And I think in the print industry, when I go to the print shows, it's like no, no one in our RMX group has ever hired 10, maybe the largest scale people, maybe, you know, but most companies and this guy, they were only 30 people at the time. He went from 30 to 40 in a month. Um, and it's like, just being around people that have, have a scale mindset and see how they think and see how they operate. Mm -hmm. And 
And then when I threw something to the group about, hey, I'm really thinking about maybe adding this position, and that guy is because nudging me. He's like, you haven't done that yet? What's wrong with you? <laughs> exactly, right? Like, yeah, yeah. you should have right. done that yesterday. Yeah. Right. But cool. and that, that, that quick anecdote there, I know we might be out of time, but, you know, we hired a position that was like not production. And this is, uh -huh. this is like 10 years ago, but yeah. we hired someone who's not production, um, not sales. It was like an ad, like administrative position uh -huh. that we're talking yeah. about. And then, you know, we did that. And then by the end of the program, like our sales and our profitability increased. And that was like a big eye opener for me. Yeah. Like, you know, this person didn't affect the bottom line and the fact that right. they were getting customers and they weren't making products or, or installing products. So like, how could our profit? It doesn't make sense, but it, it yeah. doesn't make sense when you think about the whole picture about something, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Cool, man. I want to take a, just a quick minute and summarize some of my key takeaways from our time together today. One is if you're a CEO, whatever industry you're in, like join the industry organization, whether it's a national buyers group or just an organization that supports it, get involved, network, do the live events. You know, when they go to Hawaii, when they go to Cancun, wherever they're going, Orlando, go and meet the people. Uh, very, and, and that goes along with like CEO roundtables too, and even the scaling up programs. And I'm a huge fan of scaling up. It's what I, I use for my basis many times in, in, in clients as well. Um, referral partners. So you have salespeople that focus on referral partners with the clients, the end users versus just trying to go towards the end users itself. And the last one I think was, was really powerful for me was this, this paradigm, this mindset difference between growth and scaling and, and scaling is putting in the infrastructure to allow the growth. Uh, smoother so that you're not going to pull your hair out as a CEO as you scale and, and actually have a life. And just the, there was a couple, there was two things out of there that really jumped out as, as kind of the premise for that was one was you can only improve what you measure and you guys are setting smart goals with your team to do that. And also the, the importance of that, that centralized software, the client communication, these tools and automation that allows you to really, really scale versus grow. Right. So those are my key takeaways. Um, so, so Mark, fantastic to have you. If any of our listeners want to reach out uh, to 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 use Amplify uh, for for themselves or uh, any questions on the podcast, uh, how could they do that? Yeah, uh, Amplify Graphics and Branding. It's uh, AmplifyCan.com is the website. Um, I'm I'm a big cool. part of LinkedIn. Um, I've been using LinkedIn a lot more. I have a sales awesome. company who's been yelling at me for not using LinkedIn enough for years. I finally uh, started using it a lot more here in 2023. And it's, like I said, I've got multiple candidates that want to work for us just from posting projects on LinkedIn. So it's, uh, uh, but you can find me on LinkedIn. It's uh, Mark Neighbor, uh, N-A-B-E-R at Amplify. And uh, happy to connect with anyone interested. Awesome. And we'll have Mark's um, LinkedIn profile uh, handle on the podcast page as well. So uh, Mark, fantastic having you. Uh, thanks again for coming on the show, man. Yeah, huge fan of the podcast. Thanks for having me. That means a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, for, the, for the listeners out there, please hit the like and subscribe button and help us spread the word about what we're doing here. We're helping the next generation of leaders and CEOs be that much more successful. With that, we'll see you on the next episode.